Hello, my name is Greg, and I build telescopes. <sighs> it's a sickness. Okay, um, okay so I'm going to try to uh, go through about 50 years of innovation in 20 minutes. Um, so, to know what we, where we are, we first got to know where we came from. And I'm gonna only, in order to keep this simple, I'm only going to talk about Newtonian optics, uh, which is the simplest type of telescope. Uh, I'm going to talk about the different types of mounts, the, dip the different optical tube assemblies, and spiders. Right? Yeah, we like spiders. They're creepy. Okay. Newtonian telescopes. Uh, this is the, the, the simplest te telescope uh, that we use. Uh, most amateurs build these because they are very easy to build, and they're also very easy to maintain. This uh, was designed by Isaac Newton in 1665. And the, the techniques for building them really haven't changed that much in 350 years. Uh, you have a, uh, a concave uh, mirror down here which gathers the light, a flat mirror which redirects it out to the eyepiece, and the rest of it is just empty space. Okay. So mounts. Um, this is basically how we set the telescope up to actually look at the sky. So, 50 years ago, this is basically what was available to most amateur astronomers, uh, most uh, low-budget amateur astronomers. It's a small Newtonian on a, with, on a German equatorial mount. Uh, Terry already, already mentioned these, these mounts. The uh, thing about these is that they're, they do require machining. Um, small mounts are kind of rickety. Large mounts are expensive. Uh, they're very limited in the size of the size and weight of the telescope in particular, and the size determines the, re the resolution. So the problem with these is you really can't get a very big telescope on them. Just take my word on this. Okay, so you've all heard that necessity is the mother of all invention. I'm going to add to that. Okay. I can't afford to buy big fancy telescopes or bass boats, okay? But I can learn how to build nice telescopes, okay? So now we're going to go back now. Uh, Terry has already mentioned that these things are called Dobsonians. They're called that for a reason, and this is why. John Dobson is the one who started this revolution back in 1973. He was a monk in San Francisco. Uh, he enjoyed talking about the sky. He had a real passion for astronomy and a passion for sharing astronomy with the public. He started Sidewalk Astronomy, and he is why we are all in this room right now. So he came up with the idea of building, of building large aperture telescopes on the alt as mount. Okay? And that's why those, those alt as mounts are still called Dobsonians today. So, these are, these are some typical Dobsonians today. Um, here's, here's John next to a really nicely done home-built scope. That's not one of his. Okay? Th here's John next to one, some, something that was a lot closer to what he usually built. Okay? He, uh, his, uh, his typical budget for a telescope, for a 12 and a half inch telescope, was about 40 bucks. Okay, uh, this the tube itself is a product called Sana Tube. It's used for, used for making concrete pillars. Uh, his mirrors he got from portholes from ships, he, and he learned how to grind them himself. Okay, uh, these are the the classic store bought telescopes that you that you can uh, that you can get today. So this started a real revolution because now we can build much bigger telescopes. How big? <laughs> we could go really big, <laughs> but big does have its own problems as well because now we got so big it was like how the heck do you move these things, right? So they, they got really big but they're not very portable, okay? And so people said okay well let's go back, let's look at small again because now like for instance this one here was actually produced by Edmund Scientific it's like a, uh, about a four-inch scope 
on what's called a ball mount. Well, this is just a very simplified version of that alt as mount. Now, you, instead of having two separate bearings, you just do it with all one bearing. Okay? That moves in both directions. Same concept. In fact, literally the same design scaled up to a 12 inch. Uh, other people have taken that design and they've turned, they've used it for, for refractors, where they've literally just made two round plates and mounted the scope in the middle of them and put those into a dish. I mean, this is, that's, that's a mixing bowl. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of things you can do with that, okay? Um, one of the problems with the Dobsonian mounts is when you go looking straight up, it's what we call Dobson's hole. It's very hard to control that alt azimuth scope when you're looking right at the zenith. So people started experimenting, copying the, the big scopes basically, with what's called a split ring equatorial scope, all right? And this does not have the problem of looking straight up, uh, but it's a much more complex mount to build, okay? And speaking of complexity, we can get ridiculous. This one, this one just showed up at the Oregon Star Party at the beginning of this month. Um, this is literally a technology that has not been seen for 90 years. <laughs> this mount was invented by a guy named Russell Porter in Springfield, Massachusetts back in the 1930s. The thing that is special about this particular mount, and mind you, this is the Newtonian telescope again, only this much of it is the telescope. All, all of this up here is all just counterweight, right? The thing that is special about this, though, is that the eyepiece for the telescope, you see the eyepiece right here? It's at the end of the right ascension axis. And so what, what you get out of this is that that eyepiece remains stationary while the telescope moves around your head. This is the only design of telescope that can be used by a person in a wheelchair. And it has literally not been seen for close to a century. Uh, the, the original Porter Springfields were very difficult to build because of the way they were counterweighted. Uh, this gentleman actually figured out a way to simplify that in that he split the counterweights. Here's one counterweight here, and the other counterweight's down here. So he counterweighted each axis independently, and he actually made the whole thing very simple to build. It's an amazing scope. Uh, now I did this as the last scope of the, of, or the last, last one of the, of the mounts for a very specific reason, because here the, the mount or the, the optical tube is actually coming out into the mount. So this is kind of a crossover, okay? So let's go back to optical tubes now. The optical tube is literally just the thing that holds the two mirrors of the Newtonian in correct alignment, okay? So back to our original problem here, really, really big, really, really heavy tubes. And unless you have child labor and a bus, you know, moving these things around is a real pain. But, as I said, this is all just empty space in here. There's really nothing in there. There's a, there's a mirror up there, and there's a mirror down here, and there's nothing in between. So, what if we take all that out and replace them with small tubes? So instead of having one big tube, we're going to use a whole bunch of little tubes. Well, those little tubes are removable, and they're a whole lot less weight, okay? So now you can see this one here, this is a six inch. You've got all the way up to a 24 inch here. This is a 28 inch, this is a 30 inch. So now all of a sudden, we can start getting big again. And these are movable, okay? That scope right there, I happen to know the guy that built this thing, and that takes about maybe 15 minutes to set that scope up, right? Uh, and it's a beautiful instrument. Uh, how big can we go? Well, I don't know. How big do you want? Here's a guy out here at, in uh, Fort Davis that has a 48-inch telescope that has a 16-foot focal length on it. 
That's a long, that is a very tall ladder in the middle of the night, let me tell you. <laughs> but it is worth the climb. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's like, well, that's probably about as big as you can get, isn't it, huh? No, it's not. Here's a guy in Utah. Sorry, Texas does not have the biggest telescope. It's, you know, it's, we're working on it. We're working on it, okay? Uh, so yeah, this thing is a, this is a 1.8 meter telescope that uh, is uh, amateur uh, built out in uh, Salt Lake. Okay, well, so 1.8 meters, that's a lot of telescope. Obviously, you're not gonna be carrying that thing around. And there's a lot of people out there that they don't want a 1.8 meter telescope. They're not my friends, I'm sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> they want something small that they can pick up and take, take around with them very easily, okay? And so people said, you know what? These trusses, though, those are kind of cool. And if I go with a smaller scope, I don't need as many trusses. So how many trusses do I really need? One, okay? We actually have an example of one right here, right on, this, on, the, on the stage here, and again, it's it's just a half of a, uh, the base is just a half of a, a sphere sitting in a bucket. It's a very simple, very simple mount. It's got one pole that holds the, the mirrors uh, in perfect alignment. Okay. Let's see. Uh, so one of the other things that, was, uh, that happened now is that people said, hey, you know what? These trusses, these truss tube scopes, we've taken off a lot of weight. Okay, they're a lot lighter weight and they're a lot easier to handle. Ah, look at this. We can go back to our German equatorial mounts now because the scope doesn't weigh so much and it doesn't overstress that mount anymore. Cool. And in fact, when you start looking at lightweight, we got some people that just, just don't know when to stop. Okay. <laughs> now, this... This is a 14.75 inch telescope and it weighs just over 30 pounds. Okay? Um, very, very thin mirror back here made from quartz glass. Uh, the amazing thing though is, is that this structure, you see these, these two trusses on either side here? They're actually just skinless wings made from quarter inch carbon fiber fishing rod. <laughs> Uh, and so he literally just fabricated a couple of wings uh, as, as, the, as, his, as his side trusses and in, even has a hollow bearing there because you don't need anything in the middle, right? So, as I said, or, uh, poverty is usually the father of invention, but not always. There's always an exception, right? There's always got to be one exception. Sometimes, it's laziness, okay? And this is, this is probably the ultimate lazy astronomer. <laughs> okay. um, so he doesn't even carry his telescope, he drives it, okay? Um, it has this little crawler. His name is Elvira, by the way. And yes, you see the little license plate there? He spent the 10 bucks to license the name <laughs> and has her picture on it, okay? Uh, he, he can drive the crawler up to eight miles. Uh, it has enough battery to recharge the scope for up to two weeks, okay? Um, the, basically, the, uh, the scope puts its legs down, the crawler backs away, the scope sets down, levels itself automatically, okay? All the collimation is done electronically, um, it has a full go-to package. It has the most of, I could probably spend a half an hour in this scope, okay? <laughs> this guy spent a lot of engineering. I looked, at the, I looked at the schematics for this scope. There's four pages of electrical schematics on this scope. I mean, this guy put a lot of work into this, okay? Now, and, and this kind of brings up another, another thing, is, is that one of the problems with dealing with engineers, and I'll bet most of you know somebody like this, okay, is, is that sometimes you make a smart-ass remark or a stupid joke in front of an engineer and they don't laugh. <laughs> it's not because we don't get it. 
It's because we're going, huh, wait a minute, let me think about that. <laughs> One of the problems with truss tube telescopes is getting the trusses all perfectly the same length and getting them all lined up because every time you take them out, you can change the collimation of the scope, okay? Well, about 10 years ago, or I'm sorry, almost 20 years ago now, a friend of mine in Oregon, is, uh, one of his employees was, was uh, making fun of him about someday building an inflatable telescope. And Dan went, huh, wait a minute. Doesn't work so well for him because he doesn't have a beard. You know. uh, but uh, he thought, well, what would you have to do to make a telescope inflatable? And the more he realized, or the more he thought about it, the more he realizes that half of these trusses here are under compression and half of them are under tension. Well, you don't actually need a solid tube for tension. All you really need is a string, okay? And thus, the string telescopes were born, okay? So here is Dan's first string telescope. It's a 16 inch, so he did this just as an experiment to see if it would work, and it did. So he built a 28 inch. I've used this scope many, many times. It's a wonderful instrument. It takes 10 minutes to set it up. From the time you take it out of the trailer to the time you put an eyepiece in it is no more than about 10 minutes. It's, it's amazing. Uh, and the nice thing about these, the, uh, the nice thing about this design is that these strings stay connected all the time and so the scope's collimation remains pretty close. Now the only caveat is that you have to have strings that don't, that don't stretch, okay? As it turns out, the same guy that made the stupid joke to begin with is a real materials genius and he came up with just the right answer. Kevlar archery string. It actually stretches about 2% and once it's done stretching in that 2%, it's done for good. It will never stretch again. So once you get the initial stretch out of these strings, that thing's a fixed length cable and it's never moving again, okay? Uh, this is my scope, it's right here. So if you wanna come up and take a look at it later, you can. Um, this is a 15 inch. Uh, one of the things that's nice about the string telescopes is, be is that they are very easy to, to set up. Uh, they also break down into a very nice pack, very small package. Okay, makes it very easy to carry them around. Now, one of, the pro one of the things that I encountered with this, because I also went ultra lightweight, this whole scope weighs about 50 pounds. One of the problems I ran into is that this upper ring up here is too heavy. It will sink to the floor like a stone. And as you can see, there's really not a whole lot I could take off of there at this point. I've pretty much stripped it down to the minimum. So I ended up having to add weight to this scope, which of course is the one thing I really didn't want to do. So Brian Lippincott helped me with this little solution here. Those blue bags are full of about a half a gallon of water each. <laughs> They're actually hydration packs for bicyclists. And the cool thing about them is that they have an air bladder next to the water bladder, so when you pump it up, it's no longer a water balloon, it's a brick. It's now a static weight that doesn't shift around on you, doesn't change the balance of the telescope. This is wonderful. Um, okay, so the one, the one problem with string telescopes, every telescope has its problems, okay? Everything's a trade-off. Uh, the one problem with string telescopes is that the longer the triangles get on these strings, the more tension you have to have in order to lock everything up nice and solid, okay? So, about five years ago, another guy in Oregon came up with a solution to that. And it's called tensegrity. This is actually a, a term that was coined by Buckminster Fuller for tension integrity. And the idea here is that if you can break up these long, skinny triangles into short triangles, you get the same structural integrity with less tension. And if you can go with less tension, that means you can use lighter weight parts, right? You don't have to worry about bending things, okay? And in fact, Don built a couple of them just to test this out, and look at that. This is a six-inch scope here. 
Uh, and here's a, 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 I think this is a, a 12 inch here. These cross members here that he's using are just bamboo sticks. So this thing is, is just, I don't remember exactly what this scope weighs, but it's, it's very, very lightweight. Um, and like I said, because, of the, because these triangles are now short and fat with a very wide angle at the top, okay, you don't have to have anywhere as near as much tension as you would with mine, for example. My, I have to really crank these, these, uh, these poles out pretty hard in order to get everything locked up nice and tight. Uh, with Don's design here, you don't have to at all. Um, this is a 16 inch that was built just a couple of years ago. Um, and let's see, here's a, uh, a father-son project. Uh, they built a matching set of uh, six inch and 10 inch scopes. And in fact, th these guys used uh, carbon fiber tent poles as the, uh, as the struts. And when they, when they set these scopes up, all he has to do is just physically bend the tent pole, put it in place and let it snap out. And that's enough tension to lock up that, that upper ring into perfect alignment. That's all the tension he needs. Uh, here's one of Don's scopes that he's built that is full go-to mount, you know, full go-to. You can see these are just, these are just REI tent poles here, uh, multi-segment tent poles. Um, okay, and these, these, like I said, these are very, they're very, very lightweight. They're very easy to set up and very easy to move. Okay, so the last thing are spiders. Yeah, we love spiders. Not this kind of spider. Now, if you were here last month, the very, the very last speaker last month was talking about diffraction spikes. Diffraction spikes are an astronomer's bane, okay? We hate these suckers. They're, they look nasty on, on uh, photos, and more importantly, if you're looking for that little galaxy right there, that's a real pain in the butt, okay? So, here's the thing. The, Diffraction spikes are actually caused, this, this is what's called the spider here, okay? This is what holds the secondary mirror in place. And that's, that structure is called the spider. And these veins, because these four veins line up with each other, you get a constructive interference pattern in the, in the optics itself. The, the wider the vein is, the wider the spike is, and with them having long, long veins that are lining up with each other, you get longer spikes out of it. So there's two ways of, getting, of solving this problem, basically. One is you curve the veins, okay? And this works really, really well. This, this shortens the spikes down tremendously because now you don't have the constructive interference. You still have this wide material I mean, this, is, this is stuff is like you know, almost a, a sixteenth of an inch wide, so it still blocks a lot of light, or it still blocks some light, and it still causes spiking in there. But because they don't line up with each other, you don't get the, the constructive interference. The, uh, the other way you can do this, my humble opinion, the better way, is wire spiders. <coughs> wire spiders are really nice. Um, so, these two pictures are my scope up here. Uh, you can see that with this one here, they use three, uh, three sets of wires, okay? So nothing lines up, and these wires are very, very thin, okay? In my case, I used four, and again, these, these wires do not line up with these wires. These do not line up with these, and these wires are a tenth of a millimeter in diameter, stainless steel. They're actually guitar string, I think an E. Right? And in fact, we use guitar tensioners to anchor them as well. Okay? These produce almost no visible spikes. Okay? All right. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is <clears throat> something that actually Terry already touched on. The most painful experience of coming to Astronomy on Tap, and I've been coming here for almost two years, has not been the drive downtown, it's not parking, it's not even the homeless guy trying to wash my windshield. <laughs> It's watching your poor undergraduates trying to aim a telescope. They do a good job. They, they try real, real hard. Okay. Well, they're going to do a better job now because we just put one of these on your telescope. Okay.
Okay, and with that, I'll open up to open up the floor to questions. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you so much. Do we have questions from the? Oh, yeah, right here in front. Oh boy, uh, mirrors. Well, um, there is a very small community of. Well, there's two options here. One, you can learn to make a mirror yourself. Um, after John Dobson left the, uh, uh, the society there in San Francisco, he spent the rest of his life teaching people how to make mirrors. And you can make a really, really good quality mirror by hand uh, if you just have time and patience and persistence. So right? what if you don't? Well, <clears throat> the other option is you can spend a lot of money. Uh, <clears throat> now... And depending on how big of a mirror you want, you can spend a lot of money. Uh, we're talking bass boat money here, okay? The um, T B B T. <laughs> well, maybe not quite that much. Yeah, um, lower quality bass boats. Okay. Uh, there's a very small uh, community of professional uh, mirror makers. Uh, in the United States, um, actually around the world. Um, they're, they're lonely people, okay? They work by themselves, usually in their own garage or their shop behind their house. And if you actually get, ever get them on the phone, they will not shut up. Uh, um, but they're also, they also have many, many years of, of grinding and polishing mirrors and they are, uh, they have a knowledge level that is simply astonishing once you actually start talking to them. Um, some of these mirrors, boy, let's see. For like, for instance, the, the 28 inch mirror that Dan has on his scope, uh, I think that would probably run close to 35, 40,000. Okay. Now, if you want to make, if you want to make your own, best advice I've ever, ever heard was start off with a six inch mirror. Even if you don't want a, a six inch telescope, start off with a six inch mirror because you will make the same mistakes on a six inch that you will on a 12 inch or a 24 inch, but it will take you one day to fix that mistake instead of you'll never get there. <laughs> okay, start small, make your mistakes, learn how to fix your mistakes, then go on to a bigger one. And you can make a far better uh, you can make a far better mirror yourself than anything that you can buy from Mead or, or any of the other uh, commercial scopes. Two to three times better, actually. All right, in the Astronomy on Tap shirt. Yeah. Um, there is a group. Uh, so the question was about oh, segmented, segmented mirrors. mirrors. <laughs> segmented mirrors. Wow. Um, that's a level of technology that most amateurs are not up to. Now, I will say that there is a group led by Dan Gray up in Oregon, the guy that built that string telescope, uh, where they get together every year and they discuss how to build bigger and bigger telescopes and they have touched on the idea of segmented mirrors. Uh, I don't know if any of them that have actually been built so far. All right, right over here. Uh, would you describe your uh, telescope as a, a grower, not a shower? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he just asked if your telescope was a grower, not a shower. Um, Thank you. I don't know, I, I, think it's, I think it's pretty showy actually. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of oohs and ahs, <laughs> especially at star parties. Um, the, thing with, uh, the thing with this, with this particular scope is it's all hand built. Uh, it took me almost 10 years to build this thing, figuring out one step at a time how to do the next step. Okay? Um, most, most amateur built scopes are not going to look like this. There's, there's very few that are. Okay? Um, String telescopes really started out in the Pacific Northwest, and they really haven't made much of, uh, they really haven't penetrated outside that area, and tensegrity hasn't been seen anywhere outside that area yet. 
Um, but no, I don't know how you would grow the telescope. <laughs> All right, so I see a lot more questions, but we are short on time, so our speakers will be here afterwards, so please come find them, they'll, I don't know, they'll be somewhere. Um, so please, if you have a question, <laughs> please come find them in a few minutes after the show, but for now, um, let's thank our third speaker.